Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Saul Estrin, and I'm, um, uh, well, I, I was until very recently head of the uh, Department of Management. I'm now on sabbatical. Well, I've come uh, back for, uh, to chair uh, this particular event, which I'm extremely pleased to be doing. Um, uh, I've known Greg well, for a number of years, I think it's fair to say. Uh, uh, um, I knew uh, Greg um, when he was um, already a very active uh, academic and professor uh, within Poland. I think what makes him terribly interesting is he started his career um, uh, as, a, as an economist, uh, um, and then because of the very great changes that occurred uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, uh, particularly in Poland, which led the way in the late 80s and, and early 90s. He became very involved in policy making, and he switched over uh, um, from the academic world uh, and became, uh, not once but several times, Deputy Prime Minister of the Minister of Finance between 1994 and 97, and then again in 2002 to 2003, and became a, a major architect, a leading architect of uh, the very successful reforms uh, that Poland uh, introduced. In his time, um, he, he was uh, leading Poland at the time when it joined the OECD, and he was also very involved in, in, in Poland's integration uh, when it uh, joined the European Union, and therefore he's got, I think, interesting uh, uh, ability to reflect interestingly on those matters, as well as uh, what he's been working on subsequently. He, he, he's gone back to academic uh, life now. He's director of a, a research centre, TIGER, Transformation, Integration and Globalisation, uh, which is based in the Zminski University in Warsaw. And uh, he, he's mainly active uh, as a writer of academic papers and books. And uh, he's here tonight uh, to present to you um, um, uh, his recent book, uh, Truth, Errors and Lies, Politics and Economics in a Volatile World, uh, a copy of which is making, it, making its way from the, uh, towards us uh, uh, now. And the book will be uh, on sale outside if, if people are interested at the end of the lecture. And indeed, uh, Greg has agreed, finally agreed um, to uh, sign copies if people wish to. I mean, Greg is, a, uh, is extremely interested, I think, uh, not only in issues of transition in Poland, but also in globalization. He's an inveterate traveler. He was just telling me that he's, he's, he's visited, was it 150 countries, you said? Yes, I think 150 countries. And associated with his book is an enormous data set, uh, um, which I'm sure he'll tell you about, which provides just masses of information on, on the evolution of the global economy. Nonetheless, he's a brave man, uh, because though um, he has all the information you could want and more at his fingertips, uh, he's going to uh, revert to uh, um, a more traditional uh, academic style, and there'll be no PowerPoints or slides at all in this presentation. He's just going to uh, talk, so uh, I'm looking forward to hearing him. And let me just briefly mention, for those who are interested, the Twitter hashtag uh, is up there. It's LSE Kolodko. And... Um, Greg, why don't you? Good evening. Thank you, Saul. That is my privilege to be at this great university, the famous London School of Economics. Many people would like to study here, and some would be happy to lecture here. The excuse for this invitation, which I do appreciate, is my recent book, Truth, Errors, and Lies, Politics and Economics in a Volatile World, just published by Columbia University Press. Basically, I'm an economist, and I'm proud to be an economist because I consider economics as a very beautiful science, which is somewhere between hard, tough, precise mathematics, the one one queen of the sciences and the soft abstract philosophy, the other queen of the sciences. And my approach to economics is that no one may, can make to be a good economist if one is not able to count as in mathematics, but also if one is not able to feel as in the philosophy. And after publishing 
plenty of papers and books. I've been active for a long time, so despite I'm a young man. I ask a certain person, which I respect, what I'm su supposed to write next. Another book about social development, another book about competitiveness, economic growth, institutions, globalization, post-colonist transformation, financial stabilization. The person said to me, you know what, professor, you answer the people the question, why it is as it is. First, it sounded to me like a trivial, what kind of advice it is to answer the question, how it is as it is. But pretty fast I came to the conclusion that this is the most difficult question I've been asked in my lifetime. Why? It is as it is. And I started to work on answer to this very provocative and inspiring comprehensive question. And the result is the book, which is, interestingly enough, in each language, it's published already in about 10 languages. This uh, month it's coming in Turkish, and then in November in Chinese, and in December in Arabic. And I use the Polish word, I know that there are some students from Poland, which is Wędrujący word, which is hardly to be translated into another language. It can be like the globe trotting, moving and change, cruising, traveling, uh, wandering, but wandering implies aimless, and this is not aimless, it is for a certain purpose, the curiosity to move towards a better future. And after long periods of time, after some negotiations, we have come to the conclusion with the American publisher, Columbia University Press, to call the book Truth, Errors and Lies, Politics and Economics in the Developing World. And the title of the book is derived from the first chapter of the book, which is about what is truth and what is non-truth. And as far as non-truth is concerned, what is mistake and error and what is a lie? A very big problem. I think we do have in politics, and unfortunately in economics, this time not in the science, but in economics in a different meaning, is that so many people are wrong, but some of them, they are just mistaken, they don't understand, they don't know, we don't know, we don't understand, there are difficult issues, but some of them, they are simply misleading the public opinion, so they are lying, they are deliberately telling publishing in semi-scholarly books and papers something what is not the truth. Why is this so? Well, on the one hand, because of dogmatism, because of certain doctrines. Maybe not all of you are aware of the fact how much economics is being driven by the mode, by the mode, by a fashion. There are fashionable theories. There are fashionable reasoning, fashionable explanations of the issues and processes which we are discussing in uh, economics and therefore there is a kind of inertia that is being repeated, quoted to, referred and so on and so on and certain economic concept which is sometimes called theory yet it not, doesn't deserve to be called so is taking over. But pretty often certain economists and more the policy makers are lying because they are lobbying they are acting on the behalf of special group of interests. And acting on the behalf of special group of interests calls for ability to enforce, to impose the interests of the particular groups as the interest of the whole society or the majority of the society because most of us, we act within the democracy. So therefore, that is the, where the title of the book is from, which is a risky title, because my previous major book, published 10 years ago by Oxford University Press, is called From Shock to Therapy, The Political Economy of Post-Socialist Transformation. And when I was visiting professor at Yale School of Management, teaching the class over there, I went to the library and I was keen to see at, last, at least my book on the shelf, not on the computer <coughs> monitor. So I asked a librarian to show me where the book is. And we went inside the library to the stacks to find it. And to my surprise, after some confusion, she found the book on the shelf of psychiatry. 
from shock to therapy, <laughs> it must be something about psychiatric, psychiatric issues. So I'm afraid that this book can be put somewhere on psychology shelf. Yet basically this is the microeconomics or mega economics, political economy of globalization, political economy of the future, <coughs> political economy of the interdependence of the <coughs> world, and it's very interdisciplinary. Because now, answering the question why it is as it is, why they are the countries which are definitely successful stories uh, in the history and contemporary, one may consider, with all caveats, with all the due reservations, to be successful story, my great country of Poland. Definitely China is a very successful economic story with all the uh, drawbacks which we can discuss for the whole semester. There is the success of the Western Europe, contrary to the Eastern Europe, prior to the recent developments of post-communist transformation. One may say that Botswana is more successful than neighboring uh, Zambia, Ghana is doing better than uh, Togo, Senegal definitely is doing better than, uh, say, Mauritania, uh, Malaysia is doing better than the Philippines, and the question is always why, and I'm answering these questions, what is behind the successful stories, but at the other end, there is so much uh, miseries all over the world, that there is the question why. Professor Astrid mentioned that I, I'm a globetrotter. Yes, indeed, I have explored more than 150 countries and I've seen the things. I'm writing in the book also how is, how is the life and how is the death for less than one dollar per day. But I've been there. I do know it from my experience how it is, not from the Uni another United Nations or UNDP program conference where all the speakers are getting hefty compensation, etc., etc. And I'm comparing a day on the life at the Sahel in Niger, otherwise a beautiful country, if extremely poor, but the day of life in Zurich, where the family is spending on average per capita of $2,000. So the question is, why? Actually, economics is very much about why. Why do things happen the way they do? What is the driving, what is the uh, primary cause? what is the driving mechanism, what are the consequences. And here we are coming to another part of the beauty of the science of economics, which is, I'm sure, um, clear for the economists here, that each answer is instantly a question. Once upon a time, when I was first time Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister, I contributed to the leading Polish weekly, which is called Polityka, polit Politics, or policy, or polity, it's interesting enough, wording. We have one word in Polish language for politics, policy, politics, and polity, not three like in English. I was contributing each week an essay, which was under the head, uh, answers and questions, not questions and answers. Because I follow the sentence of great John Robinson, a very great British economist, when she said that an answer of an economist is a question for the policymaker. So now the question is, from a methodological viewpoint, where is the end of economics as a science? Some of my colleagues, they say, <coughs> we are to explain how the things work, why there is a crisis, why once upon a time there was a very rampant inflation, why certain countries are having driven into the non-performing debt. Why there is a successful story in the South Korea and definitely the opposite in North Korea. And this is the end of the story. The greatest economist of my part of the world, Professor Janusz Korwin, or of Hungary, claims that he foresaw uh, the end of the communist, but you never, you will never find any work by Janusz Korwin when he was saying what to do after the collapse of the system. But you will also never find in his work any hint how to reform or how to improve the system when it existed. And that is his logical argument that he didn't believe that the system is reformable. Therefore, he was convinced that the system is doomed. Yet he never put the point up, uh, at the end of such a, uh, such a claim. And from this perspective, the economics is only descriptive to explain well, how do things work, 
to place them in uh, theory if one can, and then to explain the developments to the others. But my thinking goes much farther. If you know how the things work, okay, tell us what to do that they will work better in the future. If you understand where the boom or crisis, prosperity or misery is coming from, what is causing inequality, how inequality is feedback with the efficiency, competitiveness, entrepreneurship, etc. Therefore, what's your advice for policy making? Uh, that to this end, it still is science. But the instant you are stepping from academia and you're going to the government, this is the same like going from West Point or Sandhurst Military Academy to Bora Bora in Afghanistan. You are not anymore in a competition. You are not anymore a professor. You are a fighter. You are a military. You are a soldier. Or you are a policy maker. The logic in politics is quite difficult, quite different than it is in economics. But another part of thinking, reasoning, according to my approach to economics, is this normative approach. How to change the things for better, knowing what depends upon what. So the first conclusion is, for whatever country it is, Brazil or Egypt, Russia or China, Poland or UK, now or then, or in the future. There is no way to have a reasonable macroeconomic policy as long as it is not relying based on a reasonable, correct economic theory. And now we are looking for new economic theory. This is the time, even before the crisis hit, this is the time of the chaos. This is the time to which I refer as post-GDP economy, which calls for post-GDP economics. It is very important what we measure, because upon what we measure depends how we act. And as long as the narrow aim of economic activity on the microeconomic scale is maximization of the rate of return from investment, from the capital, and on the microeconomic scale the maximization of the rate of growth of GDP, we are, not, we are just neglecting, we are overseeing, we are missing a part of activities which are very much feedback, link, depending on, and making influence upon what's going on in our economic life. GDP doesn't say us anything about pollution of the environment, anything about income distribution, and anything about um, satisfaction from growing economy and so on. So we are looking for different measures. I'm proposing one which I refer to as um, subjective well-being index where GDP change is weighting only 0.4% and the remaining 60% depends on different factors, uh, issues, processes, which are influencing in turn economic, economic activity. The great Albert Einstein used to say that thinking has a future. I'm trying to prove in my reasoning and in my book that Interdisciplinary thinking has the great future. My self-criticism as an economist is that we, the economists, we are not able even to answer simple questions what the economic growth depends upon. There is plenty of models, uh, new, <coughs> old, still coming, which are making another step, most of the time looking forward, what the growth depends upon, but still it's missing. It's missing a part of the exercise because in the contemporary interdependent global economy, at this stage of civilization of 7 billion people, with the world output matching on purchasing power parity, 75 trillion US dollars, the growth in the first place, and in the broader sense, social economic development, depends much more on soft factors than on the hard factors. And we, the economists, we don't like them. We like what we can count. There are big colleagues which are saying, as long as you cannot make an evaluation, that is not a matter of concern of economics. So don't discuss the issues like satisfaction, like needs, like cohesion, uh, like uh, well-being. Do discuss you know, the rate of re interest, the interest rate, the exchange rate, the tax rate, and of course, which is much, much more on the political science side than on the economist, electorate. But I would say that in the world of, the, of our generation, more depends on cultural soft factors than on hard factors. And neither you, we, we cannot 
explain the recent relative success of Brazil if compared to Mexico or Poland if compared to Ukraine or China if compared to, uh, to Russia or, uh, or Botswana if compared to Zimbabwe if we are going not into the uh, analysis of this soft social cultural aspects of uh, development. So the next conclusion, therefore, our observation is, to put it in a nutshell, that the things happen the way they do because <coughs> many things happen at the same time. By the things, I mean issues, phenomena, processes, which are the trust of economics as a science and economic policy as an activity to change the competitiveness of the business and standard of living of the people for better. So there is a kind of coincidence, which is bringing me to what I nicknamed coincidence theory of development. Never ever there is a single factor which can be put in a simple model and explain what has happened. Why the Soviet Union did collapse? Why the Soviet Union did collapse in 1991, not in 1971? So in 1971 it was so competitive, it was so prosperous, it was much better than a generation ago. Why the founding fathers were able to establish the United States of America? And the men as great as George Washington, Simon Bolivar, did fail with establishing Grand Columbia, South to Rio Grande. Why he had to say when he was dying in Santa Marta in December of 1830 that there were three idiots in the history of mankind. Jesus, Don Quixote, and me. Jesus, because he sacrificed his life to save the humanity against the sin. And we are sinning you know, for 2,000 years, and the Christians not less than the other affiliations. Don Quixote, for obvious reason, you know, fighting the witness. And Bolivar, because he failed with a great project, as we would say in the contemporary political language, awarding to establish a strong, similar cultural ground of post-imperial Iberian, Spanish or Portugal, Catholic area, a Grand Colombia. But contradictory of processes, the conflicting interests uh, watered it down when he passed away. But in the North of America, the things happened the way they did. And we established what is now the United States of America, which now has a different problems in some song. So you can pick up whatever the recent story, the ancient story, uh, asking the question as an economist, as a development economist, why there is a success and why is the fla fa failure? I mean, this is very instructive for the future. I'm not a historian, but I can assure you there is nothing possible to be explained without knowing economic history. Uh, because the things happen the way they do in an original, sometimes unique way, but one has, while looking into <coughs> the future, uh, dive into the past. Actually, the book, the answer for the question, why it is as it is, is a tour de force across the time and space, across the issues, challenges, cultures, theories, continents, processes, problems, and I'm trying to show the future. Exciting. Risky, extremely risky, especially in this volatile world, the great sociologist and economist, Marx Weber, used to say about a century ago that a responsible scientist, social scientist, is not talking about the future. That is supposed to be left to prophets and demagogues. I am neither the former nor the latter. And the longest chapter called Uncertain Future is about the future. The greatest economist ever, according to my understanding, the Englishman, John Maynard Keynes, used to say that economics is not saying anything as a science about the future, because economics is the science which is explaining why the things are happening the way they do. And the future didn't happen yet. So it's not a matter of science. It can be a matter of speculation, whatever, uh, visions, or much more often, unfortunately, illusions. And many economists, they have the illusion. Many policymakers, even now, here and there, they are much more illusionist than visionaries. But economics shouldn't say much about the future. And here with disagreement, I'm saying that what kind of science it is if we cannot answer 
to people, to us, to our readers, to our students, to policymakers which are asking us for advice, what to do to change the world for better, what it will be in the future. If the economic theory holds, this is the cause, this is the mechanism, this is the result. It must, to the extent, not forever, because the matter is being changed. That is another part of the excitement of economic science, that the matter we are studying is, change, is in permanent change. It must work in the future, not in 22nd or in 29th century, but most likely next year, maybe next decade, maybe next, next generation. So certain theory <coughs> which was useful, now it is obsolete, but it doesn't mean it's stupid. It was useful at the time, because at the time it worked against different reality. Now, it's a part of history of economic thought. And we are bringing new elements, building the wall of economic knowledge. But it extends to, into the future also. And the future can be seen in two parts. The processes which must happen, do we like it or not? We, the leading economists, we, the students of LSE, Englishmen, Europeans, our civilization, mankind. <coughs> Certain processes which reach are determined by geological processes, uh, natural processes, or just demographic processes. Okay, we are any day, this weeks, seven billion people. It takes only 12 years to add the seventh billion. It takes the millennia to bring us to first billion 200 years ago. And so now we are getting more and more, there is much more congestion which is causing a sort of problems. And we know, by and large, we can argue it's really not that important now, that will be 9 billion around 2050. It's not a function of time. It's a function that from time to time, the boys and girls, they have to do something to deliver more people, much more than will be concluding this wandering process at the world. So it will be 9 billion people. Is it a message which is important? For everybody, for the governments, for the development economists, for the religious leaders, for the producers, the inventors, that there will be more consumers, there will be more producers, there will be more labor to compete, there will be more people which will be on the move. We are entering an great movement of the people, which will be getting out of control. Actually, it is already getting out of control. Maybe it is even seen and felt much more, say, in the UK than in Poland, but it will change in my part of the world too. And then there is the other part of the future, which is much more interesting and much more difficult to structure and to tackle with. The things may happen, but they do not have to. And now we have to know upon what depends, will they happen or won't. And if we know, then we have to act in a political way to, ma to help happen what we would like to come into existence according to our axiology. <coughs> For instance, say, less of inequality or more of well-being, or we have to do whatever is necessary, whatever it calls for to avoid the things which may happen, but not unavoidably must happen, for instance, warming too much of the climate, to avoid the bigger disaster or bigger problems that we have already. So that is what I'm addressing uh, at the concluding chapter, the longest chapter of the book, Uncertain Future, when I'm talking about 12 great issues of the future with capital letters, G, I, F. And they are not strictly economic. Again, I cannot answer the question if one, somebody is asking me where the crisis is from. How did you manage that Poland is a successful country? How did you screw it up in countries like, say, uh, Russia and so on, so on? When I'm analyzing only uh, efficiency of investment, capital allocation, rate of return, interest rate, stabilization of inflation, manipulating the exchange rate or the budget fiscal deficit. I can lecture, I can give a lecture on all of this topic one semester at London School of Economics in, if invited. But you will not understand after the lecture what the, how the world is going the way it is going. Okay, therefore, so we talk about everything. Everything depends upon everything. Well, not really. When I had the presentation of the book at Columbia University Press, which published the book, uh, a professor from law, School of Law said that Professor Kolotko is attempting to say that one cannot understand anything as long as one does not understand everything. Well, I'm not going that far, but pretty close. My message is, 
to understand what's going on in the contemporary world, and by contemporary, I mean the world of our generation, several years ago and several years forward, uh, one has to have, one has to imply a comprehensive, interdisciplinary, and orthodox, eclectic approach. For that reason, there is not yet any ready theory to explain what's going on. And when I listening that Professor Sargent who got a Nobel two days ago or three days ago, or maybe Professor Sims, he, he said that, that, that they theory can explain uh, and can tell us what to do with the current mess, I think that he's then wrong. Maybe they theory uh, explained what was going when they were working on the papers they published, which was awarded now because, as you know, the Nobel Prize is being given for some contribution to the theory which was done a generation ago and at that time it was quite controversial. You could read at that time that they are completely wrong by some economists which are still famous and now there is a consensus, intellectual consensus that, that yes, that was a correct theoretical approach to explain in the process upon which they were deliberating in their works at that time. But the things changed. The greatest Polish economists which, according to our dimension, John Robinson was even with some theoretical propositions uh, coming sooner than, John, uh, John, than Keynes, Michał Kalecki, he was advising Polish government, Indian government, Israeli government. He said that it's not true that the policy makers, the politicians are not listening to the economists. They do listen to the economists of the former generation. And I still have sometimes this impression when I'm following the debate about the contemporary uh, <coughs> crisis or all this economic uh, debate. Now, about the crisis. Um, it's a compromise of the economists. That so few of us had warned, had been, had been warning had been foreseen the crisis prior to 2007-2008. It's amazing. It's amazing. Go to the library of London School of Economics, you will see how few <coughs> papers or comments that the crisis at that time already, say, at the beginning of the last decade, was unavoidable. Uh, you, you, you may find that is also very telling how misleading the mainstream of economic theory can be. Where the crisis is coming from? And what is the way out? Well, this is the systemic crisis. That must be acknowledged. On the short run, Prime Minister Cameron or Chancellor Merkel or President Sarkozy may say, OK, don't tell me another lecture about you now systemic crisis. Tell us what to do. Should we go with quantitative easing tree in the US? Should we recapitalize the European bank? Should we double or uh, developed by a factor of five, as somebody suggests, the European Financial Stabilization Fund, which was endorsed by Slovakia's parliament. Also, after some political type of the war, domestically driven today, and so on, so on. These are very important issues. These are very important issues upon which, with the economies, we have different answers. There is hardly a consensus because of different ideologies, different systems of values, and different uh, interests, and simply different way of a different way of reasoning. But, and I will make one comment on that current aspect too. But this is basically the fundamental systemic crisis. Systemic crisis means that you cannot get rid of the causes of the crisis without altering the system. Okay, a week ago I had a lecture at one of the Polish universities in Szczecin. A student asked me the question, Professor, is there an alternative for capitalism? My answer was simple. If you mean by capitalism, market economy, based on dominance of private property, which is driven by profit maximization, there is no alternative. So there is no alternative like feudalism or communism or socialism, but capitalism is a very bold concept. We have state capitalism in China and in Russia or in Venezuela and Iran, if you wish. And we have uh, emerging capitalism in uh, Ghana, Brazil, Poland, uh, Vietnam, of different type. We have capitalism of the kind you have in Britain, which is not the same as, say, in more socially oriented uh, Sweden 
or we have American capitalism, which is so much different from the Japanese capitalism and so on. But this crisis is caused by neoliberal capitalism, or as some authors call it, contemporary laissez-faire capitalism, where the means of economic policy have been confused with ends, where the uh, too far going financial deregulation and weakening of the state, which was made public enemy number one by this ideology, the financial sector get rid was detached from the real sphere of economy and contributed a great deal to switching from honest, hard working capitalism of entrepreneurs to the capitalism of speculation. Somebody referred to it in the say, newspaper language as casino capitalism or casino economy. In another way, say, from sociological or ethical viewpoint, when they say that this is the system which is working in such a way that through financial fiscal redistribution, taxation and transfers and expenditures on the one hand, and the deregulation of the capital market and so-called financial innovations, a cream coming out from the growth of labor productivity is being taken over by a few at the cost of many, which can be seen clearly, first of all, from the United States. American economy where over the last generation majority of the people didn't record, didn't get any growth from the <coughs> compensation because it was taken over by the more the richer few at the cost of of many. So therefore there is no way out of the contemporary crisis if we, this issue will be not addressed. And it is addressed. It is addressed in a different way in the UK, in the EU in uh, non-European Union countries of Europe and in North, North America, and even in the countries which are, uh, aside from here, say, over there, India, China, ASEAN countries, Japan, and so on and so on. This is the, quite, the call, the quest for re-regulation of the economy. This is the question of re-institutionalization in not organizational, uh, but behavioral side. It's a long quest. It's a long quest. We are living in the moment, and now, by the moment, I mean, say, a couple of years backward and a couple of years forward, in the moment which is the result of the very long process and is making an uh, aftermath, an impact, of a very long process. You will be talking about this crisis in five years, in 15 years, and maybe in 25 years. It will be the long shadow of the crisis of the turn of the first and second decade of the 21st century. Why? Because the crisis was only initiated at the financial sector of the mighty country of the United States. Because of not a couple of greed and a couple of stupid people. Not because Bernie Madoff was dishonest and Lehman Brothers was mismanaged. And maybe some guys close to the White House in previous administrations were crooked. That's very nasty. But the, things, the nasty things happen. We cannot draw general conclusions from there. That was the systemic, uh, the systemic error. And this financial crisis, by the instruments, we, by the mechanisms we understand perfectly where, was transferred at the time of globalization to different parts of the independent global economy. Because what globalization is? Globalization is a historical, long-lasting, longer than our lifetime, chaotic, spontaneous, if not chaotic, process of liberalization and integration of thus far separately performing markets for goods labor with the delay and, ex and constraints, and capital, including the short-term portfolio, pretty often speculative capital, into one interdependent planetary, global, worldwide market. What happens here depends upon what has happened elsewhere and is causing somewhere elsewhere. We are talking here, and the stock exchange is working in India, uh, is, is already closed here, it's open still in the US, this is the 24 hours economy and so on and so on. And it shifted by the mechanisms we don't understand. It is easy to explain at the soft, soft mer first class course at LSC and at Kuzminski <coughs> University to the students how the financial sector is causing the turbulence in the real sector. Manufacturing, employment, investment, and so on, trade, export, import. And now the crisis has shifted, and it is, and it will be there for a long time, even if there will be no second wave of recession, so-called double deep, and crisis is not recession, 
recession is much narrower. The concept crisis is much. There is a crisis without recession. We don't have recession in the UK, in the US. We don't have a recession in Poland or in Slovakia, but there is a very deep crisis because this is the structural, institutional, and systemic crisis. So it has shifted to the social sphere. We have about 70, 80, maybe even more, more unemployed people now than, say, prior to the crisis, despite the output is growing on average in the world with the exception of the short period of time of the year 2009. There is more social exclusion, there is more of inequality, and there is more of social stress. We see it already. We see it literally on the streets, and on TV, and on the internet. It's a time of revolution, as I called to one of my recent posts on my Facebook. A time of revolution with a cause. It's not a rebel without cause, but as it was once upon a time. There is a cause for this re revolution, but revolution without a purpose. It's more like, uh, like, uh, like a revolt, like a contest, contestation. There will be more and more people on the streets, including even my beautiful country, Poland, which is considered to be a relatively successful story in all this message situation. And this social crisis, which is also reflected in losing the trust into the better future, will last forever. I th if I was asked what is the highest cost of the crisis in the US, I would say loss, the loss of the confidence of the people. First time ever, as it is being surveyed, the American people are saying, do you believe that your children, the next generation, will be living better than you? Most of the people are saying no. They don't believe, they lost the trust in the better future, and you cannot make a better future coming if the people don't believe it. The more so if the business leaders, if the intellectuals, if the polished politicians are losing the trust, the con con uh, conviction that there is a better future. And then the crisis has shifted to the fourth sphere, which is the political crisis, which we see clearly. Maybe in bet it is not that sharp in the UK as it is elsewhere, but we've seen it yesterday, this week in Slovakia. We see it all the time in our lovely uh, European Union, not only within the Eurozone, but in the European Union as such. And we see it definitely in the United States. The United States is so much you know, losing the time. The country is being driven into still worse situation by simply political fight. The Republicans will do everything according to the stupid rule, the worse the better. Because the worse the better means deterioration of economic situation, high unemployment, uh, and some, some more of crisis, and then the uh, White House will be again in the Republican hands, with all the consequences. So they will not help Obama administration to tackle the issues, and there is plenty, what in a sensible from economic viewpoint, administration of President Obama has proposed, but it will be not accepted because, therefore, Mr. President Obama may be re-elected. This is the logic of so-called politics. I've been in politics. It's a nasty thing, you know. It's not for honest intellectuals. It's not for the people which are looking for the truth. In politics, pretty often, an instrument is a lie to manipulate the public opinion. Because in politics, unlike in academia, you need not only to be right, you have to have the majority. I was right most of the time, because I do know <laughs> what depends upon what. And I went to the parliament to ask for majority to have the gradual reduction of the income tax, because the economy was in good mood. Ta cutting the taxation at that time was not calling for cutting the transfers. Relatively, yes, but absolutely they were growing because the tax the fiscal base was expanding, there was the growing economy. And the minor coalition in the party, which is still in the coalition now with the different party, this is another story of the politics, you know, that they can be the, in the coalition with, a, with, with whoever, uh, they said, Professor, you are right, but you right are, and they used the word which I will not use here, despite it was parliament, it was definitely not a parliamentary word. I said, what do you mean that my rights are, say, dirty? They said, okay, you are correct, but you are short of majority. I said, so what the tax cut has to do with what you are saying? If we not get subsidy for the, for the milk industry, for dairy, dairy products, we will not support you bid for cutting the taxes. I said, you know, there is not such a theory which is saying that there is any feedback between the two. You know, we don't care about your theory, but you must care that without us, you are not a majority. So that was the lesson which I got in the Parliament of Poland in 1994, and I never ever read something like this in any books of macroeconomics. <laughs> that there is the feedback, casual relation between a fiscal uh, 
implication for capital formation and trans budgetary transfers to subsidize a certain part of industry behind which was a certain part of, of, of the law. So this is the political crisis in the United States, a very serious one to be reflected. I went to the US and after the Obama speech, State of the Union, a wonderful speech, I never heard any State of the Union by an American president, but this one was very impressive. By incident, I click on BBC World online, which is always on my computer. There was the uh, minute by minute. And I saw, ah, they will be the points. And I have to know what the president said of the US because I'm going there tomorrow. And it was just 61 minutes. I listened to it. That was a great speech. And next day, I'm riding the subway, not in Warsaw, not in Moscow, but in Washington. And I'm reading. I'm seeing the woman reading the newspaper after Obama's speech about the Sputnik time, about the long-term challenge, about investment in human capital and upgrading the infrastructure to keep up <coughs> this time. We don't say anymore keep up with America, to keep up with China. You know, this is really the time, uh, a very volatile time. And I'm reading. It's not an investment in human capital. This is the waste of taxpayer money. This is what we have to listen, you know, from country to country, maybe not that often in China, but much more often in the UK or Poland or the US, that we are wasting the taxpayer money. Of course we are wasting plenty of, it, of taxpayer money. Never ending story. I've been four times finance minister, you know, I can tell, tell you uh, tragic and funny stories how much uh, true and not true it is about wasting taxpayer money. But there's no mechanism of political consensus. And this is another story which must be answered. And I'm sorry, answering because the things happen the way they do, because many things happen so many times. What about democracy in market? How democracy is uh, contributing to economic expansion and why it is making the economic growth and social and economic development even more difficult? Remember, democracy is not eliminating stupidity in market is not getting rid of dishonesty. We need something more. And the something more, this is culture. This is the institutions, which in the long run are also established by policy making at the given time. At the given time, they are given. So we are moving within the existing institutions. So what is the way out? We have to go to the fifth sphere of the crisis, which is ideological crisis. And the economists may address the issue, okay, but what to do with Europe? What to go do with Greek debt? What to do with uh, not allowing for downgrading each British bank and other country by country in the European Union because it is getting, getting dangerous, etc. Okay, we can answer this question, and this is most of the time what is being discussed. But even if we answer this question in a proper way, from theoretical viewpoint and from political viewpoint, will be not out of the crisis, because this is the crisis where we are asking the fundamental questions. Actually, what is the target? What is the aim of economic activity? Growth and growth and growth, more and more and more, still more money, more wealth, uh, or maybe being there. So what about the non-material, the cultural values? What about environment? What about social cohesion? This is the term we used so often in our European Union, which is actually absent from the political science and the politics language in the United States. So we have financial crisis, real sphere, social, uh, political, and cultural. How to get rid of that? Well, in the long run, the long run is the sum of the short run. But in the long run, we have to move in an intelligent way, seeing more than 7 billion people in this interdependent global economy, because globalization, according to my train of thought, as I defined it, is a reversible process. It's bumpy. It is going to be more bumpy, but it is irreversible. We have to move within the triangle, which is being limited by three points. First, this is the policy. The policy is subordinated to the values. We cannot blame everything for the policymakers. They are acting according to the values, and there is a great job to be done in research, in intellectual leadership, in education, in managing the culture written with the big C, to alter the values, to put more concern about social cohesion, about being more and having 
more, but not as much more as we wished so far, and so on. This is the long process. And if you will take a look, what's going on? We will listen carefully to Mr. Cameron, to uh, Chinese leaders, to the American presidential debate, debate, which is already there, despite this is one year and one month for the next election. This is very much the debate about the shifting culture in the contemporary world and the world of the future. And then we go to the second point of this triangle, which are the institutions. The institutions, as I said, in behavioral sense, meaning not organizations. The institutions, when you leave the, you leave the building, Stay for a while at the curb and take a look for the famous institution. This is traffic. Freedom is not that everybody walks and everybody drives or rides as she or he wishes. That would be messy. You have the same institutions for driving in London, UK, as they have, say, in Delhi and in India. Take a look how big difference. The difference is the strength of the institutions, the execution of the institutionalization and so on. So the traffic which is in the contemporary world of the values, preferences, stocks, flows, money, interests, etc., uh, is million times more, more complex. It must be regulated. This is the very tough fight and quest for better regulation of the market economy. If there is a question, okay, where is the success of China recently? Success of China is due to the very smart, unbelievably successful, within non-democratic <coughs> system, the combination of the power of invisible hand of market with the power of visible hand of the government. This is a part of a very brief answer. There is not a chance for better future and less of crisis in the future if there will be not a coordination between market and, now the question is, and what? Because the economy became global. And we don't have the word government. And to call for establishment another bureaucracy, the global, the planetary government, would be another utopia. We are fed up, and there's enough for utopia. After communist utopia, after neoliberal utopia, we don't need the government of the world utopia. But we do need the coordination of the policies on the global scale. And that is G20, and that is a, an attempt, not far going, of redefining the role of the IMF, etc. This is the Basel Tree. Uh, there are some other atoms, regional groupings, and so on and so on. How to coordinate the policies on the world scale <coughs> to keep the things under control? And sometimes we are successful. We have the weapons of mass destruction. They were not found in, uh, in Iraq, even despite the British were looking for it. That's, but we have. And for more than 60 years, we didn't use this weapon. But without Ministry for Defense or War of the Globe. There is the mechanism of the, on the planetary scale to keep the beast under control. But we fail to keep, for instance, certain derivatives under control, yet they were never ever supposed to be accepted to be put in, into the circulation, just by regulation. And only now there is an attempt to forbid trading certain toxic assets, which are toxic <coughs> since, since the beginning. Smart economies did know that they were toxic. Even one of the greatest speculators of the contemporary world, Warren Buffett, said, well, 10 years ago, this is the weapon of mass, this, there, some there were, there were derivatives, financial means of mass, mass destruction or financial destruction, etc. So this is the matter of regulation. And this is the long quest which we are doing, and now we're discussing to get 440 billion euro for European financial stability facility which was accepted at last today by Slovakia. Okay, there was most of the time within the European Union instead of joint action, there is a joint delay. Now, okay, now we have it. But now, most of us would say 440 is not enough. We need more. So to get more is more difficult from the institutional viewpoint and also from the political viewpoint because each government is uh, responsible to the electorate, to the people, to the society, because it is the national democracy, not the European democracy, and very short of being the global democracy. And only then we have the third point on this triangle, which is the policy, which is acting properly, relying on the proper economic reasoning within the institutions, that is a proper regulation, which is taken to the advantage the power of invisible hand of the market, but it's not being, uh, this, uh, this is, is not being uh, crushed by this power. It's, it is 
absurdity when we have to listen that the government cannot do anything because of the markets. I'm not saying that we should impose state capitalism, that the market must subordinate to what the government will say. But the government, they have to have the means to control the markets, not to allow them to act against sustainable growth and development, to keep the economy in balance, but not only from the financial, trade, export, import, current account, fiscal, etc., balance viewpoints, but also from the social viewpoint, say social cohesion as we call it, and from ecological viewpoint, sustainable development. So if you are looking, taking a look for a better future, knowing that the things happen the way because many things happen at the same time, and only an interdisciplinary approach can explain what's going on. I'm proposing this coincidence theory of development that is the descriptive approach and the normative one. What to do, I call, I refer to as new pragmatism, and this is moving somewhere within this triangle. Because there is the way out of this mess. No guarantee. The things are getting, they are tempting to get out of control. I can give you a very easy black scenario. There is no day, even today, at Heathrow, when I was leaving the plane, I had to answer the question, is Euro zone going to survive? Is there the future of the European Union? And so on. One has to have the imagination. 22 years ago, I was walking at Vaslavsky Namesty in Prague, and there was the big billboard. Soviet schemes father, Navaj Vetrasi. With the Soviet Union forever. Two years later, there was not Soviet Union and they ever came, you know, completely different. So with the European Union forever, the empire without sunrise setting. It wasn't about British, it was about the empire of Philip II, the Spanish king, you know, from Mexico through Spain to the Philippines when I've been recently. That was my 150th country, 151. First was Brunei, completely different country non-democratic, which managed in a much better way than, say, Burma. Everything is exciting. It's a very nice travel in the book. But there is the way out of the current crisis if um, certain things will be done in an uh, obvious sequence. First, it must be declared, the sooner the better, that Greece is uh, insolvent. And a lion's share of Greek debt must be written off. Until recently, 50% would make the trick. Now, to what? Not enough. Now, the Greek debt must be down, written down to about 50% of the GDP, that is by about two thirds. Be aware, if you haven't seen, and you didn't, ever, the hand which has written one signature, a bill for $6.3 billion, this is the hand. I signed the deal with the London Club of commercial banks getting rid of Polish nation of 50% of the commercial debt. It was based on very tough conditionality. It was not just given for our beautiful Polish eyes. We had to do this and that and that, <coughs> including great deal of privatization, re-regulation, deregulation, liberalization, opening up, and so on and so on where the foreign investors, including the British and the others, were able to take it to their advantage. That was just a good business. It was not wasting the taxpayer money for living beyond the means Greek or course. It was a good investment into the future, because otherwise it would be much more costly. So the question is, what it will be if we will not write off Greek debt? Then Greece must default uh, in a chaotic way, because Greece Crisis is like a train crash in the slow movement. Then, of course, of course, we have to protect the countries which are solvent, but which have the problem with liquidity, like small Ireland or Portugal or big Spain and Italy from so-called speculative attack, because actually the speculators should be afraid of what the government are doing you know, the other way around. And of course, there is the need for recapitalization of the of the central banks. But the yesterday proposition of the European Commission, Mr. Barroso, is a correct one that uh, it should be matched with a suspension of paying the dividends and bonuses to the management, or I would say mismanagement, <coughs> the cost, I guess, of the dean of management department of these banks. 
So this crisis is the very important, very challenging, and very interesting case. Uh, if one is cold blood analyst, one may say, this is really the good case study. How it has happened that so many mistakes have been committed, why this fly of the moth to the fire was not broken down five years ago, 15 years ago, where they were already the symptoms of moving, <coughs> causes of the crisis, how we are acting now, and what are the lessons for uh, the future. But the world is very volatile, and I'm asking very many of these questions, trying to answer some of them in a way which I think is inspiring to the farmer debate. And this is enjoyable reading, because my other friend said, you know what, professor, after reading some of the books, you write a very scholarly book, when you will use plenty of the terms nobody understands, with plenty of mathematical equations, and that will be the great book. I decided to do that way. If there is any difficult term that is explained in a reasonable way, I don't use equations, I use the beauty of the language, explaining the difficult things, because this is my duty as a professor, as a researcher, as an author, to think, to consider, to theorize in a very complex way. But economics, this beautiful science, supposed to be as simple as possible, but not too simple. Because if it is too simple, then we are committing the mistakes. But the things are to be understandable, and there is a chance for a better future, yet there is not a guarantee. The more we know how to tackle the issues, the bigger the chance will be that we will find a way out. Thank you. Well, not only the questions, but uh, comments, uh, criticism, because I've come here not to teach, but to learn. So I'm getting to learn and to get the message from you. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for your lecture, which was impressively delivered without notes or anything. Very impressive. Uh, my question is a simple one. As usual, it's the ordinary person in England this time bearing the brunt of the cuts. If you were allowed to get past the armed guards and all the um, steel barriers around 10 Downing Street, which is a reflection of our time, what would you tell um, the two of them in there, George and David, what, what should they do? Are they doing the right thing? Should they carry on with it? Or should they do other things as well? So the question is what I would tell the British Prime Minister and, uh, and the Finance Ministers of the Exchequer what to, what to do. Uh, I would say that from long term perspective, most of the, what they att are attempting to do is uh, rather correct. I would say then that they should not approach the problem of Euro as the problem which is not the one of the UK because you are not in Euro. By the way, I think that Euro is a good idea, that Euro will survive, Euro has the future, and UK will be never in the Euro, which has nothing to do with the current crisis because it is um, on the behalf of the city not to be in uh, Europe. But the British politics, uh, the British response to the economic crisis, with all the criticism, you know, I'm very critical about Polish uh, government, which was re-elected on this Sunday, and still I have to listen that we are the best economy in the European Union, because we are the only country which was able to avoid the recession during this uh, uh, volatile, hectic years. 
But when you are comparing British government to how it has acted over the last, say, couple of years, including the current administration, with, say, France or Italy or Mr. Berlusconi or the United States, it is uh, reasonably better than they've done uh, than they done over there. But I'm not going into the detail, you know, because this is the very particular issue. Um, I like pragmatism, you know. I like pragmatism, and I think there is a great deal of pragmatism in you know, what is being done in uh, UK, uh, contrary to the ideological-driven debate, which is uh, pretty often too much in some other places. My approach to the issue is in the current stage of globalization, the systemic crisis of neoliberal capitalism, the crisis of lack of proper policy mix, that is the fiscal policy, which is still on the national level, with the common currency policy, which is on the ECB uh, level, in the way that it should be driven by two P, pragmatism and progressiveness. So when you are asking me what I think about British government policy or Polish government policy or what is Putin and Medvedev doing or what is the Chinese response, I'm taking a look, are they pragmatic? What challenges, what issues are there on the agenda? And is it progressive? That means, according to my axiology, how much it is contributing to this uh, balanced, harmonized, long-term development in social, ecological, and economic economic, uh, economic uh, sense. The problem is that we do not have uh, the mechanism, the institution of proper coordination of policy within the European Union. And this is much more a political problem than an economic problem, how to fix the European, how to fix the European House. Um, <coughs> yes, gentlemen over there. <coughs> Hi, uh, thanks for coming in and uh, delivering a very interesting lecture. Um, I'd like to uh, sort of go into a point you made at the beginning of the lecture, which, which touched upon something I'm very interested on uh, in, in my research here at LSE as well. Uh, you said that one problem facing the US policy making um, machine, so to speak, is that it's sort of log jammed by uh, diverse sets of special interests competing uh, as different factions for, for influence, um, and that this sort of creates um, real deadlocks in, in overcoming the, the, um, the issues that, that we're facing. Um, I mean, how would you define the common interest in the first place? Uh, and moreover, how do, you, how do you derive it in a democracy? Um, is there such a thing that it can be objectively identified by any independent actor, or are we always going to be stuck with a system where where you sort of have to adjudicate between different understandings of what the common interest is, namely, you know, collections of special interest groups vying for, for attention. Uh, and, and I was just wondering what, what your thoughts are on the, um, on the very idea of the common interest and what role it plays in a democracy, because obviously we're never going to be in a sort of uh, authoritarian mindset where we just entrust one person with the... Uh, with the job of finding out what it is that is best for us as a society? Good question. Well, I think that there is uh, consensus in the room and elsewhere that non-democratic regime is not an answer for the headache and the problems we have in the contemporary world. Because if one says that democracy sometimes is not able to deliver what we are expecting from democracy as such? My answer is, democracy is a value per se. We have to admire and we have to protect democracy disregarding influence of democracy on economic efficiency. One point. Second, yes, it happens that democracy makes the things more difficult. So, the conclusion is not that we should get rid of democracy and impose an authoritarian regime. The conclusion is we have to work hard to improve democracy, to not allow to be democracy not supportive of uh, economic uh, efficiency. Um, but sometimes non-democratic regime is more favorable under certain circumstances for economic expansion than the democratic one. 
China will always be for broadly before, but that was also the case with South Korea for a long time, and for Singapore, for Hong Kong, for Taiwan, for Chile. <coughs> if you are taking a look for the recent economic successes, great one like Chinese or Latin one like say Malaysia, none of them there was a democracy in the Western meaning of the word. But I'm saying instantly take a look for Zimbabwe, take a look for Myanmar which is trying to democratize only recently, actually in the recent months, etc., etc. So we have much more cases of authoritarian regime, which is harmful for economic growth and development, than we have the successful stories. For that reason, I am not advocate of so-called Beijing consensus, which is supposed to be better than the lousy Washington consensus, upon which we relied too much in Latin America and in the post-communist countries, including Poland during shock without therapy, at the early 90s and overheat, overcooling in the late 90s, which is getting momentum in some African countries. They are saying they take a look in China, we don't have democracy, and it is working. So if we won't have democracy, it will be working. No, it is not working. It depends on something else. And this something else is very interesting, you know, because one more time, answer is question. Answer is question. Okay, leadership. How it comes that one has a good leadership? But this is the same question, why did it happen that Apple got Steve, late Steve Jobs and somebody has got somebody who is not a Steve Jobs? You know, the things happen very really good because many things happen at the same time. Going at the core to your, uh, to your uh, question. This is the quest for the truth because I could start my lecture in such a way. Economics is about rational economic activity. We're supposed to act in a rational way, to maximize the gains at the given cost or to minimize the costs at the attempted planet output to be, in a praxeological way, efficient. But are we? If we were, we, would, we were not driven into the crisis. This crisis is the utmost proof that we are <coughs> irrational, that the economic system is irrational. And there is the great debate, and it will be never a consensus in our lifetime. Who is to be blamed? Who is guilty? Too much of intervention or not enough to inter intervention? Or just wrong intervention? And so on. So. But what is the definition of rationality? And how it is related to democracy? And how it is related in turn to efficiency? Rationality, rationality is one. You or the Astrid, or government of Mr. Cameron, or the European Union, or the current civilization. Rational is the one who acts on his or her behalf, considering the information. Uh -huh. Is in the room, in the auditorium, anybody who is not intelligent, raise the hand, please. You see, all of us, we are intelligent. So presume that at least we are so intelligent that we do know what is good for us. I would like to be healthy, young, beautiful, and to have a little bit of quits, you know, pounds to enjoy the uh, life of life. Okay. So, and now I'm basing on my information, my acting, to realize, to accomplish my aims. But the critical is information. What is information? Information is data. Everybody knows what is data and this interpretation, ability to interpret the data. For that reason, you must be very knowledgeable, because you are getting so much in data as it never happened, you know, in the history of the human. And we have to know what is the true data we need for the reasoning, and what is just trash, garbage, I can tell you. 99% is garbage. In the newspapers, on TV, on the internet, and pretty often in the so-called academic papers, etc., etc. You must be very careful because your time is 24 hours a day. What you are reading, to whom you are listening, with whom you are discussing, if you want to understand what's going on, what depends upon what, and what is the truth. Because part of the game is misinformation. Why? I said already, we are in democracy. And if I would like to push forward an economic concept, which I know because I'm a smart economist, that it depends on setting such a mechanism that I will enrich you and me as a group of special interest at the cost of the remaining people, which are the taxpayers, I will never say it directly. I will come here and I will say, 
if you will uh, introduce so-called flat, flat taxation, another neoliberal idiocy. It is good for economic development. Take a look, you know, there will be less of taxation, everybody will be paid the same flat tax rate, the lower the better, and they will invest the money, and there will be the growth, and, and everybody will be better. And then they will say you, for instance, this is what has happened in Slovakia or Estonia and some other post communist countries, they will retire from the flat taxation sooner than later, etc., etc. I would never say in democracy, let's have flat tax. And that implies, under the conditions we have in my country, that about 85% of the people will pay more of taxes, and the top 15 will pay less. Because if you want to keep the tax revenue at the level the same amount as before reform, we have to raise VAT, indirect taxation, which is regressive. Uh -huh. Because if I would say so, I would, lo I would lose election, and I would like to win the election. So the policymakers are manipulating, using the economists, the media, the commentators, to get the majority, and this is how democracy works. But if you are able to keep the people informed, not misinformed, what really depends upon what? Which is extremely difficult. Most of the economists, or part of the economists, pretty often they don't understand what really depends upon what because of the complexity, because of the comprehensiveness of the process, because of the overlapping, because of the things happening the way they do, because many things happen at the same time. So don't expect it from the, from the mass of the people. They are believing, they are trusting somebody. Now I'm reading the book by the British psychologist, which is calling being wrong. This is the psychological, not economic. Uh, you must be interdisciplinary if you want to understand. So she's saying, she's proving in a very interesting way that most of the time, all of us, we are wrong. Sometimes even what we see is not there. What we touch, we don't feel. What is, you know, we are, what is scratching us, the, the limb which is not existing. So she's proving how many people how many times we are wrong? Uh, and he's bringing, she's bringing on one example as far as economics is concerned. She's referring to the uh, confession of Mr. Greenspoon at the House of Representatives in the United States when she said, I believed in the power of self-regulating markets, and I was wrong. And then she is discussing the issues in a very intelligent and proper way. Greenspoon said, I believed. She didn't, he didn't say, I knew. He didn't know. That was a belief. We are in the house of science. This is London School of Economics. It's not a lobbying grouping. I hope so. So we do not here to believe. You want to believe, go to the church or to the synagogue or to the mosque or elsewhere or to this or that newspaper or political party. But at the academia, we must know. So do we know actually what depends upon what? And this is, I think, the obligation of academia. But now if you will make the things more difficult to me, you would ask me, Professor, what you are talking about? <laughs> How? Well, I'm trying to believe you, but why should I believe you? Well, that's another interesting question. I know how the things work, you know, but the fine arts is to convince the other that I know. Uh, but, well, I'm convincing them. I'm not asking you to believe me. It's not a matter. I'm trying to convince you. I'm trying to give you the, uh, to share my train of thought. I would like you to know, to the extent I, be, I <laughs> believe that I know. See, you see, I'm saying I believe that I know. It's a tricky, it's a tricky game. But is there an alternative for, uh, for democracy? No, there is not an alternative for democracy. We must be in favor <coughs> of so-called free media. But the question is, are they free? I'm referring in my book to a case which is not an economic one. For over 270 newspapers and periodicals and magazines, which belong to the Mart of Empire, how many were in the favor of invasion of Iraq? 100%. Tell me that this is a free media. And some of the titles you have very famous in this great country, United Kingdom. It's lobbying. Okay, lobbying is a part of the game. And therefore, we must be very much aware. But sometimes lobbying is on the verge with the corruption. Is this professor lobbying? What kind of professor? Professors should, should not be engaged in lobbying. And very many of my colleagues, they are, they are consultants, they are advisors, they work for the organizations. They accept money 
for saying what they are saying because it is working on behalf of some people and sometimes they are just manipulating the public opinion, which is a part of democracy. But there is not any good alternative and uh, it, because you don't have a guarantee that if you will give the power to a narrow group of people or a single man, he will be acting in the best um, possible way. Sometimes it may happen, but most of the time it did not. You've uh, been orange. Yeah. Um, Faisal I'm a student at LSE. Um, I, most of the lectures focused on the European Union and the woes of the the financial crisis that they're experiencing. Um, my question is sort of going to change the discussion a little, focus it on the Middle East a little. Um, have your travels brought you to the Middle East and what's your impression or what are your views on what's going to happen in the Middle East in, in the respect of reserve? We're talking about democracy and economic reform, all these different things. How do you think uh, the Middle East will fare uh, in, the next com in the coming years given all that's happening on television and stuff? Oh, well, um, sure I've been traveling and if you will go to my Facebook you can find even my photo of a picture taken in Bahrain when I'm discussing and now we go to Bahrain and then there is another note about now we go to Morocco and actually I use the term spring I think the first one but I, I call it spring of nations not the Arab springs referring to the spring of nations from 1848 in our part of the world. The countries are different. If you mean, if you mean Middle East, Middle East is also very much very, very, uh, diversified, but if you go say Arab and Middle East, I am saying Arab and Middle East, yeah. because outside of Israel we have, we have Iran, which is Muslim, important, but not Arab country, which is a part of the problem. Uh, so first, why Spring of Nations? I don't think it's only the Middle East or Muslim Arab problem. You will see, and you see it already, a kind of revolt or spring in other parts of the world. Uh, mostly in the countries where it's a cry for not only democracy. My interpretation is that in country like Egypt or Tunisia, or even in Libya, it was much more an upheaval against misery and lack of perspective on the part of, on the behalf of very many people in your age, say, teen, late teens and 20s, 30s, where unemployment is a very big one. The same was in my country, in Poland, a generation ago. Now you may read, which is lying or misunderstanding, that it was a fight for freedom okay, against repressions and all this blah blah blah. No, it was basically a revolt against economic misery, against shortage. We were fed up, you know, with staying in line to buy the basic foods, etc. And only then, you know, there was all this, okay, and now democracy was come and everything, and now there is the ideology of how it was working. Now where the countries will go? They will go in a different way, which is very interesting issue also from anthropological and cultural viewpoint. I can't see, for the time being, a chance for countries like Yemen or Algeria or even uh, the more important, because they are much bigger, like say Egypt and so on, to introduce the Western type of democracy, as you have in UK for very many reasons. What I'm addressing in the book, because I did ask myself the question, why we don't have yet a great successful economic story in Muslim world? Why? It must have, it must have to have something with culture, or there must be some other specific reason which, which did make that in these countries we don't have uh, neither Poland, nor Brazil, nor China, nor Costa Rica, nor any kind of other kind uh, other kind of success. Well, there are some, sex, some successful stories, relative. And again, one of them is within the framework of democracy, to the extent. This is Senegal. There is election, there are brutal party system under control. 
it's not democracy as it is in France, but it is not a regime as it is in North Korea. And then you have the great successful story, the richest country for other reasons, but also because of the very good macroeconomic management and sensible policy. This is Qatar. Qatar has diversified the economy. They are relying on the gas, first of all. But they do have plenty of other things. This is the service-based economy, clean, advanced, without illiteracy, with the free uh, access to education, to universities, to healthcare, uh, sport facilities, etc. Just a nice country. Now, again, you have the question why they are happy to have a good leader, the Sheikh of Qatar, why the king of Bhutan is a nice and good fellow and he loves his people and for instance we cannot tell that about president of Zimbabwe. Now, where the countries will go? There will be the gradual democratization, there will be kind of multi-party system. In some of the countries there will be the military juntas, or if not junta, if you don't like the word, there will be the military regime which will be semi-democratic but will be uh, just under the grip of certain kinds of people. I'm in touch with Professor Bob Auman, Nobel Prize winner who is at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And recently I exchanged a couple of mails with him what he's expecting from this uh, spring, Arab Springs. He uh, wrote me, Greg, nothing. Unfortunately, I'm sure that it is, you know, a shift from one uh, authoritarian regime to another authoritarian regime and he's afraid that it will be worse because before at least certain issues uh, were somehow settled and now there is very many questions which are uh, open. I think there will be certain progress uh, with a great deal of destabilization in the, in the meantime, um, but definitely there was not a way to continue the system as it was before because of too much of social exclusion, too much of inequality and uh, uh, just an absent lack of a sensible development policy. These countries are different also from the viewpoint that some of them, including uh, Saudi Arabia, to a less degree Kuwait, the Emirates and Qatar and Algeria, and Tunisia and Libya, they have to get rid of the, um, of the resource curse. And I hope that democratization can help to dismantle, to get rid of the, the resource curse, which is also the problem of Venezuela, Iran, Nigeria, and uh, to the extent in different parts of the world of Russia. Imagine that Poland had plenty of oil. We wouldn't be where we are now if we had oil uh, like they have in Kuwait or in Libya. Because we were forced by the lack of resources to diversify our economy at the time of liberalization and opening up and privatization. And now when I'm asked in what Poland is specializing, my answer is in nothing. We are a little bit of everything. Once upon a time we were coal or shipbuilding industry. Now we are not. We are selling a lot and more and more and more. Not enough. Which is at the bad time a good time. Because all good deeds will be punished. And the good deed is to rely, if you are a small or medium open economy, on export led growth. So we invested in the export led growth much more than the Arab or Middle East countries export of non resort, uh, raw materials like coal or, or oil in the case of Middle, Middle East. Uh, we diversified our economy, but still Polish trade, export plus import, is half, it's only 40% of GDP. That explains, like in Poland, the losing momentum was less than elsewhere in East Central Europe and we were not driven into recession. Because we are relying much less on the other countries' market, like Slovakia or Hungary. That explains why the recession was much bigger in Italy or in Germany, in Japan or in Germany, than for instance in Italy or in the United States, which is the main maker of this crisis. So don't expect good news from Middle East for the time being. People will be on the street, less and less, 
there will be also less tragedies and dramas, there will be some breakthrough, of course the Yemen leader must go, of course <coughs> Assad will not, sustain, will not be staying there. The example of, uh, of Morocco is a very good one, that the smart king, which did make some reforms prior to this re revolt. Morocco was liberalizing too little, and, uh, but not too late, and then he made, King Mohammed made some more steps forward. Um, but I think that this turmoil will be continuing there, and it will happen also in some countries. Next, who next? The post-Soviet Central Asia. Absolutely, the regime in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, is unsustainable, in Azerbaijan, is unsustainable, despite the relatively good economic mood due to the resources uh, and so on. Yes, please. I think uh, this one should be the last question. Um, because we if Greek debt is going to have to be written off or sorry least, if Greek debt is going to have to be written off at least part of it aren't all the austerity measures that are being implemented in Greece and other European countries making matters, making matters worse and slowing down the economy and making a lot of people worse off in order to avoid something that eventually is not is eventually going to happen as I said, you know, we have to have, you have to have the eyes open. The things have the tendency to get out of control. And sometimes it can happen in a very, in a relatively uh, short period of time. There's plenty of book if you go to the, to the bookstore on Arab countries and most of the authors, they didn't foresee a year ago what is coming and so on and so on. Because something did happen here and there. So one more time. It's so possible that there will be very severe mistake or there will be too much of a panic on the side of the so-called markets and too much of delay on the side of so-called governments. Because you can follow, you can observe the current crisis in Europe as a syndrome of overreaction of the markets. They are nervous. Sometimes they are, they are panicking. They are irrational, including some rating agencies. And they're now they are competing who will downgrade who, you know. They, one agency is downgrading the French bank. Okay, then we next day the Moody's will be, or Fitch is downgrading the British banks, and who will be downgraded tomorrow? Nobody so far did downgrade any Polish bank, but I will not be surprised if some idiot will do it some tomorrow, you know, because just to join the crowd that we are downgrading the banks, and so on and so on. And the governments, are much more coordinating the delay than the action. If that will go too far, it can be uh, a very big problem. Now, is it possible that, the Greece, that Greece will leave the euro, or we deliberately, intention, or it will be forced, it will be kicked off, as some of the people advise? One of the very good economists, Nouriel Roudini, has made the point: Greece must default and leave the euro. My point is, Greece must default and stay in the euro. So, we agree on it to the extent. Would it be sensible for Greece to leave, to leave euro? If they will decide to leave euro now, it will be much more costly for Greece and much more risky for us than if, we, if Greece stay with euro, with our European assistance. So the alternative is, should we help Greece by our taxpayer money or not? The question is, should we help Greece or should we pay much more if we will not help Greece, you know, to stay in Euro and to declare, uh, to manage a control, um, control default and so on. Would Euro survive if Greece, if Greece will be expelled or will leave uh, Euro? Most likely yes, but that depends, uh, that depends on some other issues. It's not the whole story. Go back 20, 22 years ago. There was a great country which was called Soviet Union. Mr. Putin said some time ago that the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I was sitting around the, our national furniture, as we call it, round table 
in public, February, April, and instead of fighting and shooting the president, as they did, for instance, in Romania, we were negotiating in Poland how to change our small part of the world for better. We came to the conclusion, and there was a gradual process of liberalization, and then the process got momentum, and now we are where we are. Definitely 22 years ago, we didn't envisage that in 2011, there will be such many problems and such many accomplishments, etc. At that time, Nobody was saying that collapse of Soviet Union is visible. A year ago, there was plenty of talking about that, and two countries, Lithuania, Shapova, anybody from Lithuania? Okay. Georgia, anybody from Georgia? But for sure, if we have some guys from Georgia at the LSC, were saying, we will leave the Soviet Union. They were not allowed to do so. But if they were allowed to do so, Soviet Union still could survive. What is the analogy? As long as Greece is saying maybe we leave or some people are saying they should leave, there is not a big problem. Euro will collapse the next day after Germany will say we are leaving Euro. So the question is, is Germany going to say we are leaving Euro because we are fed up with the lack of possibility to coordinate, with the need to discuss with French president, with Silvio Berlusconi, and with the Slovaks, which are behaving the way they do, you know, because they have some domestic political problems, so they don't like each other, etc., etc. And especially since there is the pressure of so-called electorate, that is the German people, which understand to the extent what's going on, and which are saying, why we should to pay for the Greek? They are drinking, you know, the red wine. They are sunbathing on the Aegean Sea. They are retiring much shorter, faster than we, and we are hardworking, and so on, so on, so on. My answer is, okay, this is not an alternative. The alternative is, don't help Greek people right now and count how much you will pay for not helping them now. How much your business, how much your investors, how much your banks are being exposed for country like Greece and how costly the aftermath of the collapse of Greece, of, of Greek economy would be. So the question is, is, Greece, is Germany in any sense should be, in any sense, interested in leaving the euro or getting rid of the euro as a core of European um, integration mechanism. To my, according to my analysis, not at all. Germany is one of the greatest benefactors of this, uh, of this exercise, which is called euro. So the only positive answer is what I call escape for work, not going back. Were the mistakes? Yes, they were very severe mistakes. Establishment of the euro is one of the greatest success in the history of the post-war euro. But the very big flow, systemic flow, is that we have common monetary policy in a part of the countries, but we don't have the common fiscal policy. And every, every and each student at LSE and elsewhere knows that the good policy, first of all, calls for the proper policy mix. That is the coordination of the fiscal policy of the government and the monetary policy of the central bank. So there is the central bank, and say the policies, by and large, has been not that bad, but there is not fiscal policy common. There is the 27 or 17 fiscal policies, and sometimes it goes from the extreme to the extreme. This is the systemic flow. I say that the other problem, which uh, maybe now looks a little bit different, but I still keep in the point, it was a mistake that we were allowed to join the European Union without being forced to join Europe. All the new members of the European Union most communist countries like Poland, uh, Estonia, Slovakia, Slovenia, three are in, seven are still out. We should join Euro uh, at the time when we were joining the European Union to get <coughs> this institutional love streamlining. But I would say that it's like, it's again, you know, maybe, maybe like a train crash in the slow motion. I would say that today, on 13th of October, the survival, survival of Europe is less sure than it was yesterday. This is really very, very dynamic uh, situation. It can change in a week. Or maybe in a year we will be in a similar situation like now. There will be some ups and downs and so on. So, on. so there are double answer from your viewpoint. What is the most likely scenario or the alternatives? It looks like a tree. It goes, it goes, it goes. The more in detail you go, the farther forward the most scenarios there are. And there is the positive answer. If Mr. Barroso, the European leaders, are calling us or coming here for seminar, 
what would you advise us to do? We would say what we will advise them to do, and then they will say, but there is politics. And the very interesting and very difficult, most difficult, stressing part of being in politics that I experienced it is that when you know what is to be done, and you cannot do it because of the political constraints. That is much easier to be here at the classroom, at the auditorium, <coughs> because it is easy to be smart and to say two times two makes four. But then you go to the European Parliament or to the British Parliament, and you have the guys which know that two times two, times two makes four, but either for ideological bias or because of the special group of interest, they are saying, no, it's three, <coughs> no, it is five, and they call for a price to be bribed, to agree with you that it makes four. So we know that two times two makes four. We know that Europe is a good concept for uh, the long-term development because this is getting rid us of the volatility of the exchange rates, at least within the euro block, and it is bringing down the transaction costs, but so many mistakes have been committed in the history of economic development that one can take a look also on this tour de force from this perspective. I know that Professor Estrin now will say that our session is coming to the conclusion. That is what he says, because I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare to say so. But if we have to conclude, I will be happy to sign the book for whoever would like to, uh, to have it. And we can continue the debate. I would like to invite uh, each and all of you to join the debate on my Facebook, com slash Kolotko. I'm asking to join the debate and then I'm sitting the late nights in the evening or early night hours uh, in the morning to answer the questions. But the fun of being an economist is that it's never ending intellectual journey. Happy to be with you and join Facebook.com. Thank you very much. I'm not going to try and uh, top that. I just want to say that. Um, Next week, at this time, on the 20th, we have a lecture by Richard Rommel on good strategy, bad strategy, department of management, public lecture. Uh, um, I don't think it will be nearly as stimulating or broad-ranging as this, but uh, nonetheless, I think it will also be of great interest. So, thanks once again to Greg, and he'll be signing outside. Thank you. Thank you.